You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 83. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Maya Angelou. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters. All you got to do is head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Sign up for it there and you will get three amazing videos, almost an hour in length total in your inbox. So just head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Guys, I am super excited to bring you today's episode. We have best-selling author Will Storr and his book, The Science of Storytelling, Why Stories Make Us Human and How to Tell Them Better, is an amazing deep dive into how story affects the brain. And I got to tell you guys, I've done over 500 interviews at this point between all our podcasts in the last few years. And I've talked to some of the greatest story minds, uh, you know, analysts and screenwriters and storytellers on the planet. And it is rare for me to hear a new concept in the in the world of storytelling. And Will brought that to this episode. His combination of storytelling and science in the science of the brain and the neuroscience of the brain is is amazing. I really I I was so excited, you know, once I took a look at the book, to have him on the show, and this conversation does not disappoint. If you cannot spark an idea for a story or how to take your character to the next level, I, I don't know what else I can do because as I was talking to Will, story ideas started popping into my head. I'm like, well, if I did this to this character, I did that to that character, it was It was really a remarkable experience, and I cannot wait to bring this episode to you. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Will Storr. I'd like to welcome to the show Will Storr, man. How are you doing, Will? I'm good. Thank you, Alex. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, sir. You are on, as they say, the other side of the pond uh, we are recording from. (laughs) it's I, I I still love talking to people around the world. It's amazing our technology. <laughs> I know it's quite amazing. it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic. T- I mean, I remember when uh, you know calling the states was like a you know cost a fortune. Every minute you're being charged, you know. Oh, bucks. I, uh, oh it's I, just free video calls. Now it's free <laughs> video calls, and like we take it for granted, and now we're just like, isn't it funny how technology works? It's like once you get it, you just you assume and you you demand it. It's kind of like, oh, well, oh, why is the connection <laughs> across the world for free so bad today? Oh, God. You know, it's uh, it's insane. It's, but It's not good enough. It's yeah. not good enough. Yeah. But listen, thank you so much again for being on the show. Um, I'm dying to dig into your book, The Science of Storytelling. And before we do that, how did you get into the business? How did you get into the story storytelling business? Well, so my – 
my background is I'm a journalist um, uh, and I do a lot of uh, science psychology reporting and I've written books based on psychology. But for longer than I've been a journalist, I wanted to write stories, you know, and fictional stories. So I tried to write a novel when I was like eight years old. It was obviously terrible. <laughs> you know, <so laughs> I have always sort of wrestled with that. And then, um, you know, I did the typical young person thing, young man, young person thing of, of you know, when you're young, you think, well, ah. You know, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm, I don't need those books on how to write stories. It's you've got to be a genius. You know, you, you go through that phase, and then eventually, when you've failed enough, you go, "Fuck it!" You know, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, um, so, 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 yeah, I, I was actually um, researching a book called The Unpersuadables, um, which which uh, is about why clever people, clever people believe crazy things. And I was doing that and interviewing, you know, some world famous psychologists and neuroscientists. And at the same time as that, I started reading all these books on storytelling. So I was also working on my novel in my spare time. So I was reading The Seven Basic Plots and I read Robert McKee and, you know, all the usual kind of suspects. And I realized that what the kind of storytelling people were saying and what the scientists were saying, there was so many commonalities between them. Like the importance of change, you know, um, uh, character and character flaw, and um, I just thought that was really interesting, you know. And and so the the, the the kind of my my nonfiction book, the answer to that, why the clever people believe crazy things, ended up being well because the brain's a storyteller; it's not a logic processor. It it, it tells a story. That's what it does. It's, that, that's that's its sort of function. And 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 we tend to believe stories that flatter our sense of heroism. And that's why clever people end up believing crazy stuff. Um, and so, you know, I, car- I carried on kind of interrogating that for my, for, for, for my own kind of fiction work. And that became a course. That I started teaching a course at the Guardian newspaper on the science of storytelling. And then that became the book. So, so it's kind of a weird way around. Isn't it, isn't it interesting? Because if, if you start thinking about it, you, your whole life is story. Uh, everything we do is story. And it, and it serves not only just like, yeah, sure, we're going to go watch the Avengers and that's nice and everything. Um, but it serves a purpose because if you tell the story, I'm like, Bob went down to the river and around that corner, there was a tiger that ate him. There might be a group of tigers there. You might want to stay away from that story. Yeah. Actually helps protect the tribe, if you will, on a very yeah. elemental level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. And 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 it's um, you, you, it, I, I think the big kind of light bulb moment for me was thinking that um um, it, it isn't that the brain is like a storyteller. It's that stories are like brains. When when we write screenplays or write novels, we're mimicking what the brain does. And so, as as, as living creatures, we're surrounded by this chaos of confusing information. Uh, and, and and the brain has to kind of radically simplify that information. It, 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 there's a neuroscientist called Chris Frith that says the brain's kind of job is to, is to make you feel like you're the invisible actor at the center of the world. And and, 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 that, and that's what it does. And, and what storytellers have been doing through the, through, through the ages, fictional storytellers, is mimicking the, those processes. You know, you know the, the big three acts of archetypal storytelling, crisis, struggle, resolution. That's what happens to us when, you know, in life, when, when, when things go wrong, you, you know, you, you're, the train is late. And you're going to miss your meeting or, you know, you, you slip into kind of crisis struggle resolution mode. You're, you know, you, you, your consciousness narrows and now you're a hero at the center of this story. How am I going to do it? How am I going to get there? It, 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 and that's what the brain does to help us solve problems, to help us understand the world. And so there's so many. Once you understand that, that, that what you're doing when you're writing a screenplay is you're mimicking the way a, a brain works. Then there are so many kind of things that you can you can get from science then about how to tell better stories. So like you that example you just gave, which is basically like my train is late and you go into yeah. the, in the into the crisis mode, you know, watching Indiana Jones, that's just a heightened version of that. And, and obviously of, yeah. or watching the Avengers or watching, you know, any any of these superhero tentpole films. It's just heightened versions of the basic three things that you just talked yeah, about. Exactly. And if you're a modernist storyteller, like in the in the book, I talk about a Kafka short story, who, and that was literally his story. There was a guy on a, guy on a tram, and he and, and he noticed the particular shape of of a woman's ear, and it gave him this. I can't remember what the thought was, some profound Kafka esque thought, mm-hmm. and that's the end of the story. You know, so so so, so what you've got there is. Uh, uh, um, the, 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 what I think are the minimal conditions for a story, and that's that something happens that changes somebody somewhat. And in a very kind of literary modern story, a very art house film, 
it's quite subtle what changes, but in a great broad blockbuster, it's kind of obvious what changes. You know, the Death Star blows up, you know. Exactly. Now, can you discuss what the model making brain is? Yeah, so, um, so this is a really mad idea. Well, it's not even an idea, it's a, it's a, it's a theory that is, that is known to be true, but this is how the brain works, essentially. Um, and if you don't know this stuff, it, it's at once really obvious when you think about it, but also really disturbing. <laughs> and that is that we don't experience reality. Like we think that our eyes are windows and we're looking out of our windows into, and, we, and we're seeing the world and the, the eyes are windows and our ears are these empty tubes into which sounds come. But obviously that's not true. You don't look out of your eyes. Information comes in one way. So how does that work? Well, how that works is that is the information kind of hits the senses. The senses um, uh, translate it to millions and millions of electrical pulses. And your brain reads these electrical pulses a bit like a, a, a computer reads a CD-ROM or a DVD, you know, DVD and creates a model of the world. And what you experience is that model of the world. It's not actual reality at all. So you don't have any direct access to, to the real world. You, you don't really know what it looks like outside your body. What you're getting is this fake model of the world. And, of course, there's also debate about how accurate the model we experience is. You know, humans have a certain kind of brain that experiences a certain kind of world. But, 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 but there are some really fundamental differences sort of special effects the brain paints on to this model. And one of those special effects is colour. So mm -hmm. around our bodies, in the real world, there's no colour. Everything is monochrome. Atoms don't have colour. What happens is that it, it, some of that information is in light waves. And, and depending on the length of the light wave, your brain just goes, well, that's a pink, that's a blue, that's a brown. And it paints it on. So so, so it, it's really kind of, it, it, it's a really... When you talk about the brain being a storyteller, it really is from the ground up a storyteller. It's getting all this chaotic information and it's conjuring this multicolored kind of slightly fake world for you to live in. That is like Chris Frist says, you know, you push, it puts you in the middle of it. It makes you the all important actor at the center of it. Um, so, 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 yeah, so, so, so that's that that's that kind of basic idea. Of, and, and that's kind of what that that's how storytelling works on a very basic level. So your brain doesn't care where it's getting information from. You can be getting information from words on a page of a novel or from a cinema screen or from a computer screen. As long as it's giving it model information to build a model with, it's going to build that model. So that's why when you say to somebody, don't imagine an elephant, they imagine an elephant because your brain's just constantly making models. So that's what filmmakers are doing. Uh, they're, they're giving brains information with which to kind of build Im models of imaginary worlds. So that's why a good writer who can use the language like like a, an artisan can conjure yeah. up those images in your head so much better. And that's what kind of not only on the craft standpoint, but just on the um, not on the plotting standpoint and character standpoint, but just literally using a, a being a wordsmith. You know, yeah. you, you read a, a Shane Black screenplay and the way he describes a rainy alley, it's not yeah. like. The alley was dark and rainy. No, 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 no. You, <laughs> when he writes it, you smell it, you taste it, yeah. Um, yeah. and that is what that conjures those images in your head. So that's why that screenplay probably yeah. was sold for a couple million dollars. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. You know, when you say you smell it and taste it, that that is almost literally true. So when you put people in brain scanners and and they read um, about kind of the furry fuzz of a peach skin, um, areas involved in touch light up in their brain so, yeah. so, so 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 that is really literally true you're you, is building a model of that of that furry touch and that's why you know that, that that's why you know the best writing it has that absolute clarity you know it, 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 it it's kind of uh, it's kind of simplicity but kind of packed with kind of meaning sensory meaning you know and, and, and when, I, when i write about dialogue i think that's that that's one of the keys to really great dialogue when you look at really great dialogue it's it's it, it it has that clarity, but it's packed with information about who the character is, about where they're going, what they're doing, what the power dynamics are in, in the room. You know, in, in great dialogue, you can just you can read the first page of an Arthur Miller play mm. and uh, and know within the first two pages exactly where the story is going, exactly who the characters are, because you're because that, that, that dialogue 
is packed with so much information that the model making brain can then use to create this world and it's all unconscious so so, so it's just doing it all the time and so, so so i think that's that that's the key to that that really great dialogue writing so that's kind of why you know for for writers it's not just you know originally it was the novel you know and or with the cave painting if you want to get real technical um but you know the novel then films television now video games have an argue arguably overtaken cinema um, as as a way for people to completely fall into a world and and especially those um, role playing um, mm. RPGs where you're just walking around and th- th- they're literally creating the world with you and you want to talk about stimulation you put that you put the <laughs> earphones on you put that if you want to get into the yeah. VR mode you're you're completely gone you are in yeah, that's it because it's, it's taking away the sensory information from the actual world and replacing it with different stuff and it's like a movie. But you are literally the invisible actor at the center of that world. So, <laughs> so, so, and that's why they wonder why people get addicted to those video games and end up spending hours and hours and hours and days playing them, all because you know they are that they, they are you know creating much more incredible and interesting and emotional worlds for people to live in than their real world. So, of course, they get addicted to them. It's kind of like you know from what we've been talking about so far, the Matrix does not sound very outlandish i mean i've always said the matrix is a documentary personally <laughs> i mean a, a lot of this stuff you know on, on a, a subconscious level but like the matrix you know you arguably could maybe in our lifetime maybe a couple hundred years from now who knows but you could eventually be able to just plug in to a computer yeah. and and connect and and download and upload i mean it sounds crazy now but yeah it's not that crazy <laughs> No, well, I mean, the, the the brain is a virtual reality machine. That's that's literally what it is. It's 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 not an it's not a reality machine. It's a virtual reality machine. It creates this virtual story world and suspends you in the middle of it and fills it full of drama and you know emotion and everyone's got you know if you're psycho and psychologically healthy, you've got goals you're trying to pursue and you're engaged in the kind of emotional ups and downs of the pursuit of those goals. That's a story. That's a screenplay. You know. And that's no. and that's why that that's why when we're watching a great movie, it it feels so engaging and and, and evolving. It's just a very heightened life. It's a heightened kind of human consciousness that, that, that is kind of easy to kind of tumble into. Yeah, and and that works with cinema. That works with you know television. That works with video games. That works with a novel. I mean, yeah. I remember when I first read Harry Potter, my mind was ex- – I just like – I was I was like, what is this literary crack? I was just completely <laughs> enthralled. Or you read a Stephen King novel or something like – you're just – good writing. You're just in and, and it yeah. grabs yeah. you. It's- yeah, that's it. And I think one, one, of the, one of the sort of big takeaways I got from the science was the importance of um, – you know, cause and effect in those big blockbusters and, and the, the, you know, the, the, the great sort of best-selling novels. Um, you, you know, cause and effect is a really fundamental way that human brains understand the world and that kind of separates us from other animals. So it, th- there's one study they did where they compared um, the behaviour of chimpanzees, who are one of our closest relatives, to human children. And they, and, and they gave them the task of, like, stacking up these wooden blocks on their ends but the wooden blocks had a lead weight kind of buried in them in a weird place. So they keep falling over. And what you find is that the chimpanzees just keep trying to stack the blocks and they keep falling over and they just keep at it and then they get bored. Whereas the human children, they're pre-verbal children. They start picking up the blocks and looking at them. They're asking, you know, what caused that? What's the cause of that? So it's that cause and effect. So, you know, we understand the world in causes and effects. That's that, as we you know, as soon as there's an sort of unexpected change in our environment, it triggers our, Response. You know, we look at it; it gets our attention. And then we meet us. Oh, you know, what caused that? And what's going to happen next? And so, really, really well written. You know, screenplays for blockbusters are very clear in their causes and effects. You know, it's very. You, you, it's, it's, and that's what makes it kind of effortless to be engaged in the movie, because because cause and effect is the natural language of the brain. Whereas difficult movies, art house movies, you know, literary novels. The cause and effect breaks down. It's it's quite un, quite hard to understand. First of it, you're being shown this, and then there's this, and who's this person? And hang on a minute, why is it now 1973? You know, and and, and the reason you, you know, art house movies are often called dreamlike, and they're called dreamlike because the cause and effects breaks down. 
does in dreams, you know. And in novels, literary novels, are often called it's hard work, and it's hard work because you're having to do the cognitive effort of working out how one thing mm. connects with the other. And then you have all your arguments with your friends. Well, I think what the author really meant by the, uh, you know, the haunted acorn in the prairie was was this, and and you have all these arguments. But you don't really get those arguments about Star Wars or Harry Potter because the causes and effects are really clear. One thing leads to the next, which leads to the next. And actually, in, it sounds easy, but uh, as I'm sure lots of your view, you know, viewers know, in practice, adhering to that cause and effect is actually quite difficult. You know, having one thing then lead to the next, then lead to the next, then lead to the next. It, it's quite difficult to, to, to write that. It's, it's, it's not as easy as it You could do one or sounds. two. Yeah, you could do one or two of those cause and effects, but actually to string along a coherent cause and effect that moves yeah. the story along yeah. is great. That's yeah. actually fascinating because I, I've really never thought about that. Because like when you watch 2001, mm. well, that's that's dream. It, it, yeah. It, it, there is no – if you start thinking, like, there's really no cause and effect. There's some slight cause and effect with Hal, yeah. <laughs> with Hal and what Hal's doing. But it's so minuscule compared to Star yeah. Wars, which is so yeah. – so concrete as far as yeah absolutely the, cause this effect. leads to that 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 and it's just relentless you know it doesn't it doesn't let up and and, and it, you're glued to it and it's that effortlessness and it's effortless because as i said that's the language of the brain the brain speaks the language of cause and effect and if you don't give it that you're gonna have you're gonna have to start using you know not your unconscious brain but your you know your front brain your thinking brain so what the fuck's going on you know and that's why Right. And that's why a lot of times when you see, you know, some of the masters like Kubrick, you know, a lot of his films were misunderstood when they come out. And it takes years for people yeah. to catch up to what he was trying to say in mm. his stories. And then there's yeah. like deeper levels. And it's like, you know, like, uh, the, Ma- like the Matrix has such a deep, has, it's like such a deep onion. There's so yeah. many layers to it. Yeah. But if you just want to see the cause of effect of a really cool action movie, it's there. Yeah. But as you, well, that's the genius of the Matrix. He manages to pull off both tricks, doesn't it? Yeah, that's not that's it's Star Wars, but Star Wars with like an insane amount of depth, and you yeah. can. Yeah. So you could arguably have those art house conversations about the Matrix. Yeah. And also have the did you see that action sequence conversation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, those are my favorite stories. I love those kinds of stories that that that, that, that you know because you, you you can have you can have your cake and eat it. I think in a sense. <laughs> You, you you can have you know a great cause and effect action packed film or novel that's really thoughtful and profound. I mean, my favourite novel and one of my favourite movies is one from Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, I mean, it's just brilliant. I mean, it is just it it, it it's a relentlessly efficient plot. It's absolutely it doesn't sag much. It sags a little bit in 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 the, in, in the kind of fourth act, um, but 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 it's relentlessly um, entertaining. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's com- completely emotional, but it's also really thoughtful and profound and symbolic, and it does all those kind of things that make it that, that kind of elevate it really to, into the art space, as far as I'm concerned. So so that, that that's my you know that, that's my kind of sweet spot, and you know we don't get we don't get movies so much like that coming out of Hollywood these days. It, doesn't, it seems to me no, because 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 <laughs> Hollywood hasn't been in the in, in the in the movie business for quite some time. They're in the selling other <laughs> stuff business. They're not well. It's yeah, it's, it's kids stuff. yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, that's what they do. Stuff. It's not that where we where we're finding those stories is now t- TV streaming um, yeah. series. Okay. You know, you watch Ozarks, you watch Breaking Bad, you watch yeah. Game of Thrones. That's where you're looking for that kind of storytelling. Absolutely. Yeah, it, absolutely be, right. Yeah, it, there's no three hundred million dollar, and arguably you can't tell it to a three hundred million dollar movie. That's a little bit risky. You can't. I get it. It's a business. You yeah, know, yeah. on a story standpoint. Now, you you also talked about the domestic domesticated brain. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. So um, this is a really, again, really sort of critical kind of underlying idea behind the science of storytelling. And that's really the question of, of why. Why do we tell stories in the first place? Why did we evolve to kind of tell stories? And so um to understand that, you've got to understand a bit about about, about human evolution. And so, um, you know, we, we were animals. We still are animals, technically. But when we were kind of animals, <laughs> some, more, like, some more than others, sir. Some more than others in this world. Um, we know we, we, when we kind of came down for the trees and started hanging out around camp campfires, um, we started um, existing much more in groups 
no, tribes. Tribes, of, yeah. tribes of humans. And so um, that kind of, um, uh, we, we, you know, we, we used to like apes settle our problems by fighting and ripping each other's arms off and all this, you know, violence, basically. But when you're living in groups, you can't really do that. You, ha- you have to learn to, have to, to kind of get on in, in, in better ways. So um, we, we, we evolved to be much more um, collegiate, peaceful, and we essentially we domesticated. We, we, we went through the same kinds of changes that the, the, the wolf went through to become the domesticated dog. We became much more peaceful, um, uh, uh, much more kind of socially aware, much more emotionally intelligent. And um, we started talking to each other. And so for a long time, it was thought that we, we evolved language to kind of strategize, to hunt, but now the kind of dominant theory in psychology is that we actually evolved language in order to gossip. And that just seems like a, like a mad thing. Because like, well, that's crazy. That's such a stupid thing to say. But actually, it makes perfect sense because humans are now like humans were then. We haven't changed that much. You know, we, we, we can be amazing and wonderful and kind, but we're also quite selfish. We tend to put our own interests first. So you have to kind of um, manipulate people such, control people such without a police force or a judiciary or an army or a government, that they're going to put the tribe first and they're not going to steal the meat. They're not going to rip people off. They're not going to attack people. So how do you do that? You do it with gossip. You start telling stories about each other. Well, you, you know, so, so if, if the gossip about you in the tribe is that you're a selfish, aggressive person, um, you're going to get a bad reputation. And, and the punishment of that um, is potentially lethal. You, you know, ultimately, you would be, you know, capital punishment. Was, was 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 once universal so the ultimate the ultimate um sanction was obviously death but but before that you're humiliated um you're um ostracized or you could be kicked out of the tribe which is also kind of death so so that's how we control each other with stories with gossipy stories and you want to hope that people are telling heroic stories about you and 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 then that's how you kind of start transmitting the kind of moral rules of the tribe so you know you find out when you're growing up as a child how do I behave in such a way that I'm celebrated and I become a hero? You, you learn that through gossipy stories. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. You know, this person did, was so courageous on the hunt. You know, there was a thing, a saber toothed tiger was coming at him and he got in the way and, oh, it's amazing. So you learn, oh my God, that's how, that's how you uh, become a hero. And equally, you, you've got to learn how to not be kicked out of the tribe, how to not be killed. And that's, again, through gossip. So that's why gossip is so fundamental to the human experience. It's so fundamental to our evolutionary history. And it's at the basis of all our stories. And you think about any story that, that's kind of successful, it's basically based on gossip. You know, whether it's a, 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 you know, a story in the National Enquirer or it's Anna Karenina, it's basically you never believe what happened. I mean, know? it's, it's the Iliad. It's the Iliad. It's the Iliad. Yeah. yeah, it's it, gossip. It, but, yeah. And it's all, and it's usually stories, are, especially if they're sort of, you know, big screenplays or big best-selling novels, they're, they're, they're completely morally infused. You know, they're, they're, it's full of uh, heroes doing morally good things. And very often at the end of the story, when they really prove their heroism, it's, the, it's, it's um, uh, you know, they put the tribe's interests before their own, and that's how you you you, 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 you know you identify them as the hero. They finally bust through their own self interest and in, and blow up the Death Star. You know, so, right. so, so 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 gossip is 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 fundamental to our evolution. It's fundamental to it. we couldn't survive in society without gossip, and it's always there in successful stories in some way. Yeah, I mean, you are. I mean, even within the stories, the characters gossip about the other characters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you watch Shawshank Redemption, which is one of my favorite films, and, and yeah, yeah, they're yeah. they're constantly talking about, oh, there's that quiet guy, Andy. Yeah. Well, what's he? Like, yeah, what's well, that's go- it. And, that, and that's how we learn about people in real life and in stories through, is is through gossip. But I think gossip's a universal. We we when we think about gossip, we think, oh, it's a terrible thing that people do and they shouldn't do it. But everybody does it. It's, it's a universal. It's cross cultural. It crosses the genders. Men and women gossip just as much as each other. But the scientists find that men gossip less when women are present. So we, we <laughs> say, so when it's just guys, we're just as bad as the women. Oh no, no, it's we, we, absolutely we pretend that we don't do it. You know, absolutely <laughs> true. When the dudes get together, then the boys are together. We're like, did you hear? Did you see what that dude I did? Know, I mean, believe. yeah, exactly. Or, or then you gossip about what the football game you saw the day before. Yeah. Like, did you did you see what Beckham yeah. did? Did you see what you know? Yeah, it's a form of gossip because it's this moral judgment. You, you, they, 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 you know, they, 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 were, they were terrible. They didn't do this thing. They right, right. Done. 
didn't pass the ball or whatever it is. Yeah, it's, it's gossip, gossip, gossip. It infuses our lives. And, and if you think about it that way, if language evolved to enable us to gossip, then the first stories, the original stories, were go- that it was, was gossip. And again, I think that's really that's a really sort of powerful insight for me about storytelling. When you read about uh, the psychologists when they investigate gossip, that you know they talk about how it works, and most gossip is about moral infractions. We're not that interested in gossip about people being amazing. We much prefer gossip about people being sort of dangerous. Well, obviously, National uh, Geographic, uh, not just yeah. right, National Enquirer, is kind of like yeah. the bad that's stuff. Valuable, that's valuable intelligence. It's much more important that we learn who's the threat because that's been, so, so we. we yeah, and so 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 you hear that that gossipy story, and um, you you experience a, a very specific emotion, and that emotion is moral outrage. And moral outrage is is interesting because it it compels you to act. It compels you to want to punish the transgressor, to rescue the the, the person that they're there attacking. You know, you, you feel like you want to act. But of course, if you're watching a movie, you can't act. So what you do is you keep watching. You kind of glued to the screen. You keep watching, um, uh, and then when finally, when when you know when Darth Vader gets his comeuppance, it's just this amazing emotional release. And when you feel that amazing emotional release, that's your tribal, you know, survival circuitry being manipulated by the storyteller. It, you know, and, and that was all evolved tens of thousands of years ago when we were kind of learning how to live cooperatively in tribes. And I think that's one of the reasons the the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that they took a decade to build that tension up to the point where in the end game they finally to defeat Thanos. It was I mean it's yeah. a masterwork. And I I watched the video on YouTube like the the crowd reaction <laughs> with uh, if anybody hasn't seen End Game spoiler alert um when when everything's down captain america's down you know thor and and iron man and then all of a sudden everybody shows up at one time <laughs> to fight thanos it was like this roar and just like this amazing look i'm getting goosebumps just talking about it yeah I'm, I'm, like, I'm listening to you talking about it but but you know but that take it seriously because those goosebumps that's your evolution you know yeah. you know when you know, when your when your tribe um, arrives on mass to fight the enemy, right. we've evolved to have those goosebumps and to want to go yes, because that's 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 how we survive. That's amazing. That's so like I I knew we were gonna we were gonna poke the bear in this episode, and this is <laughs> this is this is awesome because I love talking about neuroscience and and yeah. specifically but that's, neuro- it's a practical thing too because you know often when I'm teaching storytelling and and especially when I'm getting the novelists who are who are wanting to write this kind of high literature stuff. And you say to them, well, where's the moral outrage in your premise? You know, why, you know, it's really important. If you moral outrage is such a powerful thing to get people glued into a story. As soon as, you, as soon as you're experiencing a story and you experience moral outrage on behalf of a character, you're in. You care about them. That's, you know, it's working. But, but, but if there's no sense of, oh, my God, that's not fair, it's very hard to understand, well, where's the, how are you making people care about your character? Or this situation, if there's no and moral outrage, it doesn't have to be directed at a human being, as is right in the book in, you know, in John Steinbeck's um, uh, The Grapes of Wrath. The moral outrage, you know, it's set in a dust bowl and and, and there's a drought and and the, the, the you know the family are pushed out of Oklahoma and, and you feel moral outrage on their behalf against the weather. You know, it can be that, but as long as you know, but you feel like, oh my god, it's not fair. They're an amazing, the clutters. They're such a hardworking family, and look what's happening to them. Oh my god, I hope they survive. And as soon as you start feeling those things, you're in. You know, he's well, got you. Well, the easiest, the easiest way to, I mean, this is an old technique, but the easiest way to make a a villain villainous is, well, have him kick the dog. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, you exactly. you have the, the the bad guy kick the dog. It's done. Like he's. There's like oh he's got to go, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know. <laughs> he's got- yeah, I mean, and, and that's it. And, and it's one of those things, you know, because I'm interested in storytelling, but I'm also reading all these science books. You often I haven't had this experience of, you know, reading these science books and they say stuff like that. And you think, oh my god, that's just like story. And one of them is that when they when they do surveys of the content of gossip in hunter gatherer tribes that still exist, they say that most of it is about moral transgressions by high status people. So, you know. Um, you know, big shot behavior, you know, unpleasant kind of big shot behavior. And you think, well, that's story. You know, that's so that that's so many stories are kind of focused. You know, the, 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 the enemy is a high status person who does something bad towards a low status individual or a dog. Right. Because you know, that, that's just, just it, it's imbues modern storytelling. And it's 
all it is all the way back in in, in our gossip that we, that we used to tell. Because we are we a lot of times we are unless you're the king, you are yeah. on a lower standpoint. So you you identify much more with the dog than you do with the king. Generally yeah, because, speaking, because yeah, we were never the king, you know. They, you know, we, and also that's the other interesting thing about human groups is like chimpanzee groups is that is that um, you know when we were evolving, there was never really a king. Human groups were always relatively leaderless. Um, so, so it was the group that's always in charge, and the group is cohering with these kind of gossipy, gossipy, gossipy stories, and 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 you get these awful kind of ter- terrifying accounts in the in in the ethnographic literature of. You know, some poor bastard is, you know, there was one I read recently where some woman died of, of, a, of what, what we would know is a disease. But in, the, in, in, in Papua New Guinea, they didn't know it was a disease. They decided that it was a, an act of malicious sorcery. And so the sorcerer does this magic ritual with some leaves and some burning leaves and decides this guy did it. And this guy's going, fuck, you know, and, 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 and uh, within days they went around gossiping behind his back and consensus built they had to be dealt with. And he was killed and eaten. You think, well, there's, hell. well, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's that. <laughs> yeah. But, it, but, but that's how terrifying it was. I mean, you know, so, 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 you know, that's, that's gossip, you know, these days gossip, I mean, on, on social media, gossip can be pretty lethal for someone's careers these days. You know, we get, we're getting back to that. People aren't being killed and eaten quite, but, but you see the power of gossip in human communities. It's, it's, it's a lethally dangerous thing it's a very powerful thing gossip and then social media has heightened all of that because now our tribe is the world and if you do something or you know a video comes out or you say something that you're not supposed to you they pull something out from 20 years ago that you tweeted about or something and your whole life is gets up thrown upside down we've seen careers yeah ostracization it's the same all the stuff that happens cancel culture online is just us being tribal as we have been for tens of thousands of years the the reason that all those you know social media platforms work is because we're tribal you know we've got the follower accounts we've got the status updates you know it's all it's all tribal and it's all working on this on this very dangerous Mm -hmm. very addictive very compulsive very emotional tribal neural architecture and you know cancel culture is just tribal ostracization you know it's what it's what we've been doing at our worst for tens of thousands of years so yeah, I know. Let's not get into social media because that's no. a whole other conversation. <laughs> it's dangerous, um, yeah. It's, uh, it's so can you, can you talk the, about the differences between the Western stories versus Eastern stories? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So this is something that came up in, in – in, in, actually, I wrote a book about social media um, and it came up in there. And I just thought this was kind of fascinating. Um, so as lots of people um, surely know, one of the big cultural differences between East and West is the East – in the West, we're much more individualistic. Mm-hmm. In the East, generally speaking, it's more communitarian. And there are various ideas about um, about how, how this came to be. But, the, but, but you know, one of the ideas is that um, it all stems in the West. It all stems from ancient Greece. We, in, we are naturally groupish. We are naturally thinking groups. Um, uh, but in the West, uh, we had this in ancient Greece. There was this weird kind of um, uh, landscape. Uh, we were living in little islands and little communities. We couldn't farm because the soil was so bad, and we were forced to kind of survive on our own. You know, we we couldn't survive as in China. They had massive rice growing communities and sure, uh, irrigation projects. Yeah, so they had so to survive in China, you had to be part of a group. The group had to be working as one. In the West, was, you had to stand in your own two feet. So 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 out of ancient Greece comes modern european culture you know self-love narcissist not the word narcissism for god's sake comes come, comes from ancient greece um uh, so, so 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 and that still kind of directs the differences in how we see the world and it also directs the differences in, in the kind of ways that we tell our stories so um for the westerner uh um change is essentially down to the individual we have the individual hero, problems strike the world. The individual hero rises up like a Greek god, fights the monsters and comes back with all the boons and whatever, where else, and, and learns the truth of the story. Um, but in, e- in East Asia, they don't have stories, but they, they don't, they have other kinds of stories. They don't tend to tell those kinds of stories because they don't see change being the, the role of the individual. They see change as being kind of the role of the group. 
And so what, what you get in China is kind of these kinds of stories that we that we find difficult to process as Westerners because for us they don't have any endings, for example. So one of them they have four act stories, and in that one change happens to somebody. In act two, um, uh, it just carries on for a bit. <laughs> act three, you're just you're taking somewhere else to a completely different place, different context, different time, different person. Then act, f- act four, you're back to the first person again, and then it ends. And you're left as the viewer, the reader, to, 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 to work out wh- ha- how, how do all these different, disparate elements kind of achieve harmony. Um, and so when I interviewed um, a psychologist in South Korea, he said, you know, you Westerns don't understand these stories because you want an ending. You want the hero to come back to with ha- having learned the thing and you want to be told what the truth is. But in the East... Um, you know, we understand that that that, that change is that, that, that you know change is kind of a part is is is, is the function of the group, and that um, your job is to um, work out how these kind of disparate elements can achieve harmony and how both of these things can be true at the same time. So it's a very different way of kind of telling stories. It's a very different way of understanding the world. Um, I could go on and on about it, but I won't. But but yeah, but but but, it's, but it was very interesting to me how. Um, the, you know, this, you know, the crisis struggle resolution thing is particularly a Western model. Um, one of the one of the sort of quick takeaways I found was extraordinary was that in China they didn't even have autobiography um, uh, uh, until very recently. So for us in the West, who we think about, we think of individuals and individual heroes. What could be more obvious than telling the story of a hero? You know, you would do that. It's an obvious thing to do. But autobiographies never really came about in China until um, relatively recently. And when they did come about. Um, the kind of subject of the autobiography wasn't in the middle of all the action. They were in the periphery of the action, kind of looking on at their lives, kind of commenting on it. So, yeah, really different ways of telling stories. Now, why do you think, though, that American culture and individualistic culture, specifically the American culture, has completely invaded the rest of the world and has been so accepted? So our movies, our music – our culture, you know, even from, I, I would probably argue since the seventies and eighties, it's when yeah, it started to yeah. be our number one export is our culture, which is yeah. extremely, you know, individual. It's all about me. It's about the yeah. champ. You know, it's about, it's <laughs> yeah. about, look, it's Rambo. It's, it's Rocky. It's, you know, it's, it's Stallone. It's Schwarzenegger back in the eighties and nineties, like these bigger than life, you know, uh, heroes that, you know, took it all on themselves how why is that so popular in eastern cultures uh and how did how did that even become a thing yeah that's a that's a really good question so so i i you know, i haven't really thought about that in that way before but, but my immediate response would be that of of course you know the 20th century was the american century and it, you know at one point culture was all coming from italy and then it was coming from the from the uk yeah and, and, and now it's america's turn because you're now the western superpower and you know whereas everybody wants to look to italy or us in the uk or, or, or you know england and now they look to you I, I, you know uh, so so i i think i you know i, I think there's that going on but uh, but i also think that i think the success of american culture um uh in the east is a product of the, of the fact that kind of these individualistic um, um, individualistic values are, now, are are spreading around the world. So, you know, individualism from ancient Greece through to Italy, through Western Europe, and then to America. You, f- from individualism, you get the um, you get the you, you get the Enlightenment. You get um, the invention of human rights. You you get capitalism. So 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 basically, modernity is this kind of. Um, and, and, and individualism are very, very kind of tightly bound. And of course, that's going to spread around the world um, now. So I think wherever you get capitalism and capitalistic values, you're going to get individualistic values too. Um, one of the places that I wrote about in my book, Selfie, was about South Korea. Because South Korea is really interesting because it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's the most westernized Asian country. Yeah. Right. So, 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 um, you know, it's it, 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 it's between Western values, but they've still got the Confucian values about family and group too. And what you also get in South Korea is like unbelievably high suicide rates. You know, the pressures on young people in South Korea are just so high because in the individualistic West, we kind of tend to feel like we have to please ourselves 
in the East, they have to please their group and their parents. In South Korea, they have to please everyone. And it's just a nightmare. So, so, so but, but of course, in South Korea, you do get, you know, the, those Western films, Western music is also really big in, in, in South Korea. So I, I, I think that, yeah, wherever you get those Western values of, kind of capitalism and uh, uh, you, uh, you, you're going to you, you're going to find a, a kind of good ground for western art too right because I, I mean you look at a, like a country like india which is obviously an eastern country you know bollywood do, is it's a they make much more films many more films uh, yeah, their yeah, industry yeah. is so much larger than hollywood but yet yeah it doesn't travel Bolly- no, it's true. Yeah. It doesn't travel like Bollywood films. You know, they don't do they don't do much business here at all because they're very specific in this kind of storytelling they have. Though I don't know if you've seen yes. some some of the yeah. some of the visual effects are fantastic, and some <laughs> of the stuff that goes on in some of these action Bollywood films, you're just like, this is awesome um, <laughs> because they're so outlandish. But they don't they don't travel. But yet our sto- our stories, and it's not just about budget and about visual effects and and, and that kind of stuff. Because other mm. countries have that now, China and India and, and other countries. I think those stories. Tra- that's the question I have. It's like why have our stories been able to travel into these com- into these tribes that historically don't like these kind of stories or are not grown with, well, or maybe yeah. it's maybe it taps into something that. Is inherent in all of our, all of us as, as our ego inside yeah, well, needs individualism. Because yeah, again, I'm thinking about, you know, before Hollywood, there was like Charles Dickens and, you know, Shakespeare. Sure. And of course, yeah. Yeah, you know, the storytellers. The Iliad, um, yeah, things like that, yeah. Yeah, also, you know, yeah, in, in ancient Greece, those stories, or, or you know, uh, of travel around the world. And I was also thinking about, there was, I forget what the tribe's name is, but, they, but there was a tribe where they have hardly any language and uh, and so there was a theory that this was a this was the only this was a human tribe that didn't have storytelling and so what the researchers did was they took a dvd of the reboot of king kong and showed the tribe this dvd of king kong and they said they went mad they loved it you know they were cheering all the right places running around in fear you know so so it is really i i I think what 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 it's difficult for me to say because what from everyone from Shakespeare, from you know from Shakespeare to Dickens to Hollywood today does is tap into very universal kind of ideas that sure. seem to be able to travel in such a way. But 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 yeah, it's, it's a good question. You know why? What, what if, if you want to know why um, stories from India and China don't travel so well in the other direction? Perhaps it's because. At least over the period of history we're, t- we're talking about, it's, it's Western culture that's gone out around the world rather than the other way around. And maybe you know, in the future, maybe that'll flip. Maybe in a, you know, in a, in a couple hundred years, it'll be Chinese stories we're all into. And <laughs> who, know, who God knows what's going to happen? Yeah. You're very optimistic. A hundred years, you're very optimistic <laughs> um, with what's going on in the world. I, I hope there I'll is another long. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I hope there's a long tail, sir, to the, to the human race. I really do. Um, now, can we discuss a little bit about the flawed self and how that yeah. translates into storytelling? Yeah, yeah. This is a, a, for, for me just uh, probably the most important kind of thing that, that that I've kind of worked out as I'm teaching this stuff, and that's that um, if there's one problem that storytellers have, whether they're writing screenplays or novels or whatever, is that they've got their plot and they've got their characters, and they're not they're not connected. You know, usually they've got a great idea for a plot. They say, well, what if this happened and this happened? And I say to them, well, you know, um, tell me about your story. And they give you this sequence of events, and I say, well, tell me about the character, the protagonist, and they go. Oh. And then you say, well, look, how do you know that's the sequence of events if you don't know who your character is? Because your character is deciding those sequence of events. So I, I suppose that, you know, it always goes back to the same thing, which is a story is a self. You know, when you're writing a story, you're recreating true reality that comes from a true real person. And if you think about yourself as a story, you are a particular character with a particular background, with a particular selection of flaws and problems. Um, and you have a goal and that goal comes out of who you are, comes out of your background, your values, your hopes and dreams. It's a product of your character. You also have your flaws, you know, and you uh, you know, for all of us who are alive, you know, part of being alive is, is that you keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. You know, you keep getting this thing wrong or these things wrong. Um, so, and, and those are your kind of obstacles as you go through your life, you know, that's the plot of your life, your goals and your kind of obstacles. And that's how it should be in story too. You know, so you should have a flawed, 
you know, the, 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 the plot uh, should come out of who that character is. The plot should come out of that character's flawed idea about um, the world. And the example that I use is, or the simplest example, well, the example that I use in great in depth in the book is The Remains of the Day by Shiguru, you know, book of um, um, award-winning uh, novel. And so, you know, that's that's about this guy, Stevens, who is an English butler, and um, his kind of flawed idea of the world, his 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 complete kind of conception of how the world works is that England and the English are the best and everyone else are idiots. And if you want to be, um, if you want to be um, a, a good proper English butler, you have to exercise emotional restraint. So it's really an interrogation of that old idea of the English upper lip, you know, it's like stoicism, strength, anybody that doesn't do that is an idiot. So, 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 so the story that Ishiguru tells around Stevens is that, you know, he, so he, he hasn't placed Stevens' story at the height of the British Empire, heart of British power in, say, 1880. He's put it in 1950, um, when the decline of British power is, is beginning to be in full swing. The aristocrat that he used to serve is now long gone, and there's an American dude who, who now he has to um, uh, serve in his, in his, in his um, mansion. But the American's really friendly and like jokes with him and he's, he like, talks to him on a level and he can't cope with it. He can't deal with it. So, so all of the things that he's having to deal with in his life are, um, are challenging that idea of English supremacy, um, of the English stiff upper lip. And, and the story of Lorenzo is him trying to cope with that. And so, so that whole story comes out of his floor. It comes out of his character. And a much simpler example from the world of sort of blockbuster movies is Jaws. You know, you think about Jaws. What's Jaws? Oh, it's a movie about a killer shark. And yes, of course, it's a movie about a killer shark. But 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 that movie is structured around a flawed self with a particular flaw um, that, that he has to struggle with. And that is that Brody, this police chief who has just recently been put in charge of the you know coastal resort town of Amityville, is scared of the water. Like he's really scared of the water when he when, when he gets the ferry across from the mainland. He can't even get out of his car. He's so scared of the water. And so the great sh- the shark comes along. And, and, and what, what that means is that he has to, he has to wrestle with his flaw. He, he can't carry on being scared of the water anymore. He's either got to go out there and deal with this thing or, he, or it's over for him. So the shark kind of pulls him out. And then, and then you know, so at the exact midpoint of the, of the, of the movie, he's, he goes out to the, you know, he, he, he gets the courage to go out into the water and fight the shark. And act four happens the shark fights back. He, you know, he, he, he decides he's made a big mistake and he wants to go back to shore, but he can't. And then finally the great denouement, he kills the shark. And, and as he's swimming back to shore with his oceanographer mate, the very last thing that you see in the, in the movie is him saying, I used to be scared of water. I can't imagine, can't imagine why. So you see this great character change. So even a film like Jaws, you know, when I first wrote the book and was teaching this stuff, people used to say to me, Oh, well, that's true. All this stuff is about the floor character in very literary novels and very art house, like, you know, intelligent films. But it's not really true in action films. And so like, what well, it is, actually, but it's just not that high in the mix, you know, yeah. but it's definitely but, it, but it's there, you know. So so, so that's that. It's, it's, it's like if you, it, 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 the, the plot needs to come out of the character and it needs to and it, and it needs to be interrogating an, uh, that character's flaw and changing it, I think. Isn't there, but isn't what you just said with Jaws, that's essentially life. You know, you meet people along the way that will challenge your flaw. Yeah. Will will challenge, like if you're, if you're afraid to stand up for yourself, I promise you, you will meet a bully. Yeah, that's it. And and, and, and how I think about it is, is is that is that most of us go through our lives and things are generally okay. But 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 often, you know, something will happen to us that will completely that will specifically trigger us and will flip out and get really emotional. And people go, "Oh, fucking hell!" You know, that's your flaw. That's your kind of sacred flaw that 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 that, that I want to hear a story about because you know. So so, so, and, and that's what happens in lots of the great stories. Um, uh, it's that the, the, that kind of ignition, the, the, the change that happens at the beginning of the story, which ignites the story, connects specifically with somebody's flaw. In Jaws, you can't be scared of the water anymore. In the remains of the day, you think English, you, you think the English are so fucking great. Check out this American boss, and check out you know um, the decline of of English power in the world. You know, so so so, so that that to me is 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 uh, you know one of these things that is, is really off, often missed, even in um, stories that get made. 
you, you, you get the sense that you've got they've come up with this brilliant idea for a story, but they've just got this cut out and keep vaguely good looking politically correct people to do the story and it's and it's, for me it's not good enough you know it's you can sense when it's there you know the, the, the kind of propulsion of the story and the originality of the story and the thing that's making it not an exercise in you know color by numbers is that it's coming out of a, 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 of, a, 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 a of a character with a very specific flaw and in the book i won't do it now because it takes a while but in the book i, I, I use the example of lawrence of arabia in, in, oh, in yeah. depth you know talking because you know that that's a great example of that's all about this 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 one guy's particular flaw and it's both completely absorbing uh, emotional but also really original like, you, you just don't know what's going to happen next and, right and, and he and in lawrence of arabia you literally have him completely beautifully dressed at the beginning in his whites, everything, yes. and he looks polished, <laughs> yeah. and he looks great. Yeah, yeah. And at the end, it's torn apart. He's got blood on him. He's got, That's and you can yeah. visually see the difference between how that character changed. And that's the yeah. one of the brilliant things about that film. But you see that yeah. in in a lot, and you know, it's kind of like when you see that that fresh recruit, that fresh private, come off the plane to go to war, and as as he's going into war, you see. The guys have been in there for a year going out and you see the difference <laughs> in their faces and their expressions and yeah. their look and what they've happened to them. And that's, that's life. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's sorry. And, 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 you know, when you're doing the war movie, you know, like what, what, what kind of a person is war going to change? And, and the thing about Lawrence is that he's got, he, you know, you see him at the beginning of the movie and he's really cocky, arrogant, yeah, oh, yeah. anti-authoritarian, and, it, and he's a bit of a, just a bit of a prat, you know, you, you, you come across him at work and you think, oh, that guy's a real dick. You, know? yeah, yeah. Um, you drop that dude in a war zone and you see what happens. You know, he becomes a monster because, you know, he, he keeps being this rebel and he keeps thinking he's, he's above everybody else. And it turns him into a, 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 you know, a monster. And, you know, and it has that amazing transformation at the beginning where he's berating somebody else for being a barbarous murderer. And by the end, they flipped. And now that person who is berating is berating him for being a barbarous murderer. I mean, it's this perfect, you know, it's perfectly done in, in, in that movie. Now, can you talk a little bit about the God moment? Yeah. So I, I, I think um, what, one of the things that, um, that, that you, in, in archetypal storytelling, you know, what, what happens, you've got this flawed character and something happens to them, which kind of, challenges that flaw which forces them to um uh deal with that flaw you know that brody you can't be scared of the water you've got to choose now are you going to be scared of the water or are you or are you going to you know deal with your your fears and so of course when that happens they lose all control over their lives and their situation and, and the more they fight and the more they struggle the more they lose control and what you see and 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 that kind of loss of control happens on on, on both the kind of levels of story it happens on the level of the external drama sharks out there killing everybody but it also happens it happens on the inter, interior psychological world of the of the protagonist you know that they're, they're, they're struggling with who they are fucking who am i going to be now am i going to be you know is is stevens and remains the day going to be somebody who who is actually emotionally warm and can tell people he loves them and cares for them and isn't just a cold bastard, or is he going to carry on being a cold English, you know, unemotional bastard? You know, what are you going to do? And so, and what you see at the end of story, uh, archetypal storytelling is that, is, is that they finally, um, they finally get control over both of those kind of elements of story in, in one kind of perfect moment. They get control over the exterior world of the drama and the interior world of who they are. I mean, the obvious example is Star Wars, where Luke uses the force to, you know, get control over and blow up the Death Star. But he also has the courage and becomes that hero. And so and, and it's, it's almost like a fleeting moment. And, and I call it the God moment because that's the archetypal. You know, who's the who's the who's the hero of the greatest story ever told? It's God. You know, religion is the most powerful story ever told. It obsesses billions of people around the world. And, you know, God's defining um, uh, characteristic is control. And if you think about it in its broadest terms, that's what we're all seeking. That's what brains want. They want control over the world, because if we have control over the world and ourselves, we get what we want. So we're always trying to seek control. We're always trying to work out to get control. And, and, and that, that feeling of having control is kind of blissful. And, and you know, that's what we see. And, and that's very often we see the, the kind of dramatic climax of of archetypal stories is that is that wonderful moment. It's like at the end of One from the Cuckoo's Nest when when Chief um, 
picks up the um, concrete control panel, throws it through the window of the mental institution and, and jumps, you know, runs out into the moonlight. Like the story doesn't end 10 minutes later when he's having a piss behind the tree or like, a, you know, two days later when he's arrested and sent back. It ends at that moment uh, because that's his God moment. That's that beautiful moment where he finally, you know, uh, got control over his floor. And it's almost a, a it, as well. it's almost a self-realization in in that yeah. moment, in that small moment of whatever that is. It's like, I, oh, I, I got this. I, yeah. I, I realize what's what's going on, um, and and you were saying about people wanting to take control because they get things. I mean, there's you know there's few people in the world that might take that a little extreme. Uh, <laughs> some of some of the worst human beings in history have taken well, that to the ultimate degree. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, really, I was thinking about the Darwinian thing, survival and reproduction. You know, fundamentally, what all living thing, things want to do is work out how to survive and reproduce. How do we do that? And in human groups, we live in social tribes. It's about working out what are the rules? How do I behave in order to be seen as a hero and get status? Because if we get status in life, we tend to get rewards. Um, and, and that's the same as kind of for any animal. Um, so, 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 you know, very often in this archetypal storytelling, uh, the God moment comes when they have an act of kind of pro-tribe selflessness. Um, just like, um, you know, Luke Skywalker risking his life for the good of the rebels so but, but why i have to ask you this though why is breaking away from the tribe or at least putting the tribe ahead of your needs looked upon as i guess that i could ask I'm, I'm explaining it to myself i'm actually answering myself because yeah. you're looking like that like why is that being held up to a higher standard where when it really is about the tribe and being and being working with the tribe as opposed to being that individual who goes out and breaks the rules and I guess it's the sacrificial part of them. Like, Oh, they're so great because yeah. they sacrifice themselves for the better of the group. Yeah. So, so, so I think, I think the, the, the basic idea is that most of us are pretty selfish and most of us are looking out for ourselves. And so you kind of need to be bribed in order to put <laughs> them first. And so part of that bribe is, that's what heroes do. And when you do that heroic thing, everyone's going to tell you you're amazing. And we're going to give you all these gifts of attention. And, you know, you know and, and really, when they do studies about, of status in hunter-gatherer tribes, they find the highest status individuals have better access to better mates. So they get their choice of sleeping you know, partners. They get better access to the better food. They get safer sleeping sites. So there are rewards um, in human tribes and in all kinds of animal communities um for earning status and in human in human groups you're kind of bribed with status you know the status of a hero the status of a, a, a of a loved person if you do these kind of selfless things when, when, when they look at uh, morality around the world they find that that's the kind of the basis of human morality is selflessness when you put other people before yourself no matter where you're around the world people think that's great and wonderful and when you put yourself before other people no matter where around the world, people think that's shitty. So, so, and that's again, that's a tribal thing. It's it's that kind of because we're selfish humans, we, we we have to be bribed to act altruistically. And part of that is is part of the way that we kind of propagandize that. You know, in the book, I say that the story is tribal propaganda. It's propaganda. It's saying, you know, if you do this, if you have the courage to attack our enemies for us everyone's going to think you're amazing and you're going to get to marry her. She's really hot and you're going to get that steak over there and everyone's going to say, you know, so, 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 so that's kind of how it, you know, that's kind of how it works. We have this idea of the hero and, and we all try and try and be, you know, if we're psychologically healthy, we all want to be the hero. It's very, it's very different. Uh, how, how history looks at Genghis Khan versus mother Teresa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I mean, and that's it. I mean, the, 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 this isn't sort of part of the book. This is part of my next book, actually. But but yeah, there are different ways that humans uh, can earn status. And, and the, the three main ones are dominance. So violence, which is what we've been doing since we've been animals. Then there's virtue. So being, um, you know, virtuous, obviously moral. But there's also kind of competence. You can play success games. And it's like a, a chef will earn status by being amazing at something. So you get stories about that stuff, too, you know, about somebody becoming the best ice skater rather and and it's it's and now is that one of the reasons why we because i anytime there's a movie a documentary uh, a story in regards to telling a story about a person or group that were exceptional at whatever they do and i'll watch a documentary on like the greatest 
tennis player, the greatest yeah. sh- this, the, yeah. the greatest chess player, um, yeah. the guy who knows how to paint with his foot, like <laughs> whatever, like, like that's the dude or that's the girl who was able, I, I, I'm drawn by those kind of stories. Is yeah. that why those stories, like Rudy, even in Rudy's not a good example because he wasn't the best. He just hit, he just was, <laughs> he was sick and he was obviously sick in the head and really, really wanted to be on this football team. Yeah. God bless yeah. him. So, so, so no, that, but that, to answer your question, that, that, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So, 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 um, the, 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 in our evolving tribes, you would have punished dominance. So people don't like dominant people. Um, but you would have rewarded virtue and you would have rewarded competence too. So, you know, the, if you're a great hunter, you 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 raise in status if you you know so and you know war movies if you're courageous you raise in status so so yeah you know all these um stories that we have about people doing incredible in documentaries you know about people doing yeah. incredible things yeah I just they, saw they're, they're, they're heroic because it's, an, it's amazing that you can do that and that, that's not a chance thing that humans find that amazing we find that amazing and thrilling and entertaining because we've evolved to reward that kind of behavior because that kind of behavior is really useful for the tribe. If you've got this expert who can do something incredible, that's good for everyone. So, so it's, it's no accident. None, none of this is accidental. You know, we, yeah. we love to watch that stuff for, for a reason. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously the things you, the examples you gave are, are actually practical things that can, people could actually use. But like, I just saw a documentary of the fastest Rubik's cube solver yeah. who happens. Yeah, me too. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I, they, they, I love that with the cube. They, I, I, I'm fascinated by the subculture in general, Yeah, but then like, the, it's like serious. It's like done. And I'm like, yeah. how? Like, and that's, yeah. And you but look at some, good, that's a good example because so, so there's two things about that. Well, the first thing about that is that, is that, is that you can't take it too literally. So we do, we don't have a part in our, brain that um makes us think that people who are expert hunters are amazing it's just expertise it's just a basic general any, rule. any expertise expertise is great you know so um uh and the, the second thing about that rubik's cube movie in particular was was it was full of um morality and kind of heroic behavior oh, yeah yeah the, the, the guy who was the rival of the newcomer was so wonderfully magnanimous oh, and, oh it was amazing i was in tears you know yes and again, that is that that's playing with your tribal emotions. It's that it was this amazingly rare virtuous display of you're you're better than me and I love you. You never see that. So no, you, that, you, I think you, that's a special film. No, you watch you watch uh, the Kong uh, Donkey the Donkey Kong documentary about the guys who are fighting to be the best Donkey yeah. Kong player in the world. <laughs> yeah, the King of Kong, King of Kong. What King an amazing! And that, that that guy, the rival, was the complete prick and everybody yes. hated him yeah. because he was so yeah. arrogant he walked around with a yeah. freaking tie and a video that's arcade it, yeah. and like he was such <laughs> he had a mullet it was just oh he was yeah. such a prick yeah but that's it again and again that's trouble because you know we, we hate big shot behavior if somebody puts them up if somebody status is earned you, the, the the group gives status um if somebody goes in and claims it we just hate them like, you know, I'm a sucker. My guilty pleasure is reality television. I love a bit of reality TV because <laughs> it's pure gossip. And, and I'm, it is. This show got below. I think it's a big show in the States, but we don't know. We've only, it's only just come out here called Below Decks. Oh, I've heard, I've heard about it. It's, it's, yeah, like, it's... it's like Downton Abbey on the, on yachts. And, and, <laughs> and every season they have, they have a couple of real pricks who go on there and think they're above everybody else. And you just love hating them. You love hating them, and then they get fired, and you go, "Yes!" <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that that's what triggers. That's why reality TV is such a you know, it's such a heightened reality. It's not yeah. reality. It's you know, I don't think it, yeah. it has been reality for quite some time. But those that storytelling aspects, they they just they just tech they just um tap into our tribal instincts okay. on yeah. the good guy, the bad guy, the the, the yeah. all that stuff. And I've got a controversial kind of opinion that I think the reality TV producers are the great unsung heroes of storytelling because they have to get all this raw material from all these idiots. And they tell, they, you know, they tell them that they, they have to make stories with them. And, they, and, and when it works, they do it to spectacular effects. If we have the show in the UK, Love Island, where just a bunch of kids are, are, are chucked in a resort. Yeah, I've seen it. So, yeah, 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 Love Island. And it's just like, they, you know, they're not the brightest people. They're, not, they're, all they're pretty, they're pretty. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. And, and bickering every day. But every single day, they build a story, a 45 minute story out of that. And every single day, they get millions of viewers. And that to me is a kind of genius. Well, you watched That's storytelling. But if you watched, I mean, did you guys see, you guys saw Tiger King, right? Oh, 
That was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah. in such an awe. Like, and I've talked about that on the show before. And please forgive me, everyone listening. But I mean, you watch Tiger King. My wife looked at me like, "Why are you? What? Why are you watching this?" I'm like, "I can't turn away. This is a this is a train wreck." And as yeah. the story continues, you're just like, "No, no, that can't yeah. really have happened. No." And then, like, it just yeah. every every episode was like. That's not real. How yeah. how is that? <laughs> That's a good example because one of the things I write in my book is I call it the dramatic question, mm-hmm. and, and, and and so the dramatic question is who is this person? Who are they really? Like when their backs up against the wall, who are they going to be? And so um, um, you know they're going to be the flawed version of themselves, or they're going to be the new version of themselves. And so so lots of the so the best drama is when the action is forcing. You know, you come across as I did before, I'm sure, the character to show who they are. And that's true in the remains of the day, because you find out more and more about Stevens. He's a, he was a bit of an anti-Semite at one point, And you go, oh, God. And then you find out something good he did. And you go, oh. And on that kind of level, the Tiger King was, was exactly the same as the remains of the day, because you were constantly being told new things about who the Tiger King was. And sometimes you were going, oh, he's a hero. He's amazing. And other times you're going, oh, my God, he's a fucking lunatic. He's you know, and it's- you're, he's constantly asking that dramatic question: "Who is this person?" And it played with that dramatic question so well that it was just it just kept you going till the end. I mean, I was always sure Carol was evil, but well, obviously Carol, Carol, obviously, ki- ki- obviously killed her husband and fed it to Bastard, the tigers. Yeah, I mean, back yeah. at her Baston. Um, obviously, obviously, there has to be that. But then you watch, like, when you're watching that show, and spoiler alert: one of the the, the handlers, the the girl, got her arm. Yeah. Torn off by a tiger yeah. and yeah. that she was so kind of cool about it. I know she was. She was, she was like, she was, heroic. She was yeah. heroic. Like, and then you started to think about them. Like, I love her. Like, I can't believe that she would be like, she didn't sue. She didn't bitch. She didn't like, Oh my God, this guy's a crit. Yeah. No, she went back to work like four or five days later. Like it was. And, and what is that? <laughs> that, that is, a, that is a display of selflessness. She didn't sue. She didn't bitch. She wasn't me, me, me. She was like, I'm going to put the the, you know, the zoo first. Yeah. So that's why she's heroic because that's the essence of heroism. I mean, she had her arm ripped off and then literally she put herself first. So, it's, so that is, yes, yeah, it's, but that's a, another great example of selflessness as, as heroism. And then you see him like com- constantly, it's all about me and he takes the, the crown oh, and he's, the he's yeah, so he's self involved. <laughs> and then the best part about, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking about Tiger King. The best part about, cause I don't talk to people about Tiger King cause I I'm in quarantine. So I don't talk to people about it, but, um, <laughs> but the best part was like when you hear those, when you saw those music videos that he was doing yeah. and you're going, is it me or is the Tiger King have a decent voice? Like why? Yeah. He yeah, shouldn't yeah. sound this good. No, then we come to yeah. find out that it was dubbed and somebody else yeah, was someone else. Saying, yeah. Which makes <laughs> yeah. all the sense in the world. Yeah. Because I was like, yeah. of course, of course he did that. Yeah. Of course yeah. he did. He merely yeah. vanilla this. <laughs> <laughs> it was so Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I, I mean, when they were making, whoever was making that, they must have been just thinking every day, oh my God, this is gold. Like, can no, you imagine I, going home every day from that set? It's just, it's just, it's and just, just going like this, this, I, I can't. Yeah. But it was also just constructed so beautiful. Oh, it was, beautiful. It was yeah, just yeah. the sixth episode, yeah. whatever amount of episode, it was so well constructed. It was so elegant. It was so brilliantly done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, elegant is the only time you'll ever hear the word elegant and Tiger King in the same sentence. <laughs> was the but craftsmanship so of the good story. at those, you know, like from making a, making a murderer was so brilliantly made as yeah. well. I mean, Netflix are actually you, you know, we I used to, we used to be quite proud in the UK of BBC documentaries, but but the Netflix have made BBC documentaries look terrible. I mean, you know, like they're, 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 they're making such brilliant f- non-fiction films, Netflix. They're, they're, they're kind of leading the world, I think. In, in series in docu- and stuff like that, in docu-series yeah, and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's all still very celebrity-led out here. You know, send a celebrity on a journey and, God, it feels so dated now. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, we, yeah. we, 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 we're known for our celebrities as well here over here in yeah, the States. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we, yeah, I mean, you know, when there's people out there like the Tiger King and – you don't need a celebrity. You know. Absolutely not. You, 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 it's always a celebrity in tears talking about their childhood. It's like, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I want. I want to ask you one last question about the book. Um, what is the difference between plot as a recipe versus plot as a, symp- is a, a, a sympathy for change? Or sympathy so, of change? Yeah. Um, yeah. So th- this is something about. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, I was just talking about how, 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 how when story analysts in the past have tried to work out how story works from Aristotle through to Robert McKee and, you know, whoever, they, they, they've only had other stories to, to, to go by, you know, so, so, so Robert McKee, I keep forgetting, he's, he's, you know, the, the hero with a thousand. That would be the, the Joseph Campbell. Yeah, of course, Joseph Campbell having a having a middle aged moment there. Yeah. yeah, in Joseph Campbell, you know, all, all they have to go on is previous stories. So they get all the previous stories together and they compare them and they go, well, this is what they've got in common. And there's no there's no way of kind of communicating that what they come up with as their solution as than as a recipe. This thing happens and then this thing happens and then this thing happens and then this thing happens. Um, so uh, and that you know sometimes that works in with star wars with jaws and some and, but more often than not it just when you're watching it it just feels like it's a recipe someone's just followed a, a recipe um and i and i think the good thing about starting with the science is that you're starting with something else you you know and you're not starting with the recipe and i think one of the kind of basic things about about human attention is that we're attracted to change you know if there's change in the, in the room we're just going to look at it it's how great stories begin and and so you know in the book I, I I talk through various ways you can use traditional plot structure, but in a smarter way with you know using it properly with character. Um, but you can also uh, you know forget all that stuff and and, and just j- just understand the fact that humans love change and you know really great stories are, a, are like a symphony of change and there's all kinds of different things that can change on it you know the character can change. The situation can change. The people around the character can change. The character's goals can change. The character's understandings about the world can change. You know, in really great stories, there's all these changes happening all at once and all these kind of different levels. And at at its most kind of abstract kind of art house level, that's what a story is. It's like, you know, it's stuff changing. And, you know, of course, the more that you kind of shape that, the more it becomes a kind of archetypal story. So that's that's what that's about, really. It's, 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 It's about understanding that if you're just following that 22 part mono myth, without really understanding some of this other stuff about kind of character and how people actually work, you, you risk just following a recipe and coming out with a supermarket cake. I mean, I know we can talk for at least another two or three hours uh, about <laughs> this. I'm, 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 uh, I'm fascinated with your, your, your point of view on story because it comes from science um, and it's yeah, it's, it, it, starting place, it's yeah. a different starting place. This is not theory. This is like okay, how do we? Ta- and this is what Hitchcock said years ago. He goes, "I'm going to find eventually, just find a way to p- play a, 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 it's like pianos on a note. I want you to feel this boom, and you hit this point, and yeah. you laugh. This then you cry. This when you get scared. And a good storyteller knows how to trigger all those elements. But if you, as a storyteller, understand, yeah, the rules of what. Yeah. See, we I think a lot of times screenwriters specifically and storytellers in general, we all look at story from the story's point of view. We rarely look at it from the audience's point of view in the sense of how to trigger the audience. It's generally more of a – sometimes it's ego-related, meaning it's like it's my story. I'm going to tell this story. But you never – you know, it's rare to finally think about like, well, how is – the audience member going to react to this or how is the audience member going to react to that? It's not something that's trained in Hollywood. It's at least not to my yeah. understanding. No, no, but, but then I think that's because we just didn't know for such a long time. I mean, the science that's in the book is, is mostly very recent science of, from the last sort of 10, 20 years and especially the evolutionary stuff about moral outrage and status play, you know, you know, you know, how 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 do you um, get people to empathise with an antihero like Tony Soprano or Humber Humber? We just didn't know that until we understood gossip, you know, and how gossip works and why gossip works. So 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 all these kind of previous people that have attempted to kind of tease out the secrets of storytelling, they just didn't have. I mean, I'm just lucky that I've had the, these tools at the, my disposal because I happen to be alive now rather than 30 years ago. Well, I mean, but you it, look. It gives us a whole new toolkit, you know, all this psychology. Right. So, if you look at like a character like um, Walter White from Breaking Bad, who's an anti-hero, yeah, there is moments. When, anytime I'm looking at an anti-hero, like I'm right now in the middle of watching. I'm not sure if you know the show Sons of Anarchy. Um, oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's a it's it's a motorcycle gang here, and 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 the way those characters have changed. Right now, we're finding it a place where the main characters are. They they have no moral code anymore. They're they're losing their moral code. Walter White lost his moral code yeah. Uh, yeah. along along the way. 
Yeah. But anytime you look at an anti-hero, there's always moments that he does or she does something morally correct that holds you on just yeah. just a yeah. second longer before you just say this guy or this girl has to go. And towards yeah. the end, Walter yeah. White, even – even in the last episode, spoiler alert, um, is <laughs> you know he still cared about Pinkman. He still yeah, exactly, yeah, that, that, and that's the thing. I think he's another great example of the of, of the you know even of the tribal emotions. You know because at the beginning of that, the, 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 the screenwriters go to great lengths to get us to empathise with it. Oh. He, he's low status. He's a teacher. He loves his job. He loves his wife. He's, he's pregnant. Broke. He loves his son. He's, he thinks he's going to die and selfless, selfless, selfless. He's working in a spare, spare time in a, in a car wash to raise some more he money. Has a handicap, you know, he has he, a handicapped he's son. Doing it, he's doing it all right. for the family so he could die. So, 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 so they do all of those things which subconsciously make us love him. We root for him. And, and, and these are such powerful emotions and they're so embedded in us that even when he's literally dissolving the bodies of his enemies in bars of acid, we're still <laughs> rooting for him because right. he began as his underdog. And, and the other thing that you often find with um, anti-heroes, whether it's Tony Soprano or Humber, Humber or Walter White, is, you know, the, 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 they're partly they're quite low status. So Tony Soprano wasn't the highest. He wasn't John Gotti. He was in this, I think it was the Staten Island mob or the New Jersey yeah. mob. He was, yeah. in a, he was in a crap mob. You know, yeah, it was a low level mob. He yeah, wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't Gotti. Yeah, you that, know. yeah uh, he was surrounded, uh, and, and what they are, they're, they're usually surrounded by much worse characters. So, so, so Soprano in the first episode, Uncle Junior and his mum were both plotting against him. He was trying to, you know, he was doing all these quite nice things. He 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 he, he had this kind of anxiety attack when he saw some ducks. So very sensitive, you know. Um, it's it's, it's, so there's monster. loads of reasons for us to like him because he's, he's very low status, and it's the same as Humber Humber in. In Alita, I mean, how do you get the reader to care about a paedophile? Well, you just put a much worse paedophile in the story and have him kill him. So, you know, so, so you know, it, I, again, in the book, I talk about Lolita in, in a lot. So that's not the only thing that happens. But 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 when you actually sort of, you know, really um, interrogate what the um, or what Nabokov did with Lolita and Humbert Humbert from the perspective of the psychology, it's it, 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 there are so many little things he's done to manipulate us to care about Humbert Humbert. And it's all about making him low status, making him selfless. Uh, you know, he, he he doesn't do the really bad things. There's one of the kind of most egregious parts of that plot was that um, the leader's mum had to had to die in order to say he could get his hands on the leader. But rather than have Humbert kill her, she was just randomly run over and it, <laughs> like in the street. And it's like, oh come on, that's so bad. But but <laughs> but, but, but but he couldn't have Humbert kill her because then you just lose. You lose her. So. Right. Yeah, so, so he's constantly, constantly, constantly thinking about, you know, what you were just saying. He's constantly thinking about how the audience is feeling, and 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 he and he and he, and he, he, he manages it beautifully. I mean, Jesus, to get you to to to, to care about a, a, a paedophile is quite an extraordinary feat. Yeah, exactly. And and at the, and towards the end, even as Walter White was coming to his end, I still kind of cared about him we do yeah it, it's course. so yeah. weird and she's like this guy's yeah. a monster <laughs> he's a monster yeah. but he's a, like he's kind of a good monster it was just such yeah. a it's just a such an amazing uh transformation yeah. Yeah. um yeah. now i'm gonna ask you a couple questions i ask all my guests um what are three screenplays or three movies that every screenwriter should uh study oh my god that's a really good question i mean you, i'm gonna show my kind of era now because they're all from the same, era, roughly the same era. But like, um, I love Doubt. Uh, this yeah, Doubt. Oh, that's so good. Just extraordinary. Oh, so you good. know, like, you, you, um, uh, it, one of my, I, I was once teaching a, a class and I had somebody in the class who said she knew the person who wrote that. And she said even he didn't. So if, if, if any of the people watching don't know Doubt, it bases, it's based around a Catholic priest. And you're never, the doubt is, is he a pedophile? Uh, pedophile again is he a pedophile or not and even the um uh the guy who wrote the screenplay didn't know he hadn't decided so it's a really amazing example um, fantastic screenplay about doubt about that um i love american beauty because american beauty is another example of a story which is relentless in its plot but also really moving really deep um in you know um incredible characters so that would be my second one. Um, and what other um, screenplay would I say uh, is essential? 
would say Dow, American Beauty, and let's say Magnolia, because I think that's another one, yeah. another Philip Seymour Hoffman one. That, you know, there's another one which really, that was such a great period, uh, you know, the, the kind of late 90s, 2000s, for really amazing American film that didn't compromise in terms of watchability, but was really, it was elevated to the level of art, I think. Yeah, I was. I think it started with the ninety, the early nineties, with the Sundance crowd of filmmakers, yeah. which a lot of yeah. those guys came in and made those films. But then the studio started giving them money, um, yeah, <laughs> to and, and and a little juice behind them, and that's how like American yeah. Beauty and and yeah. Magnolia and those kind of films were made. Um, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in in the in your business or in life? In my business, it's probably more interesting. Uh, uh, brevity. You know, um, I, a lot of my books used to be quite long. And um, I, I don't know if you know, there's, there's, there's an English writer called John Ronson uh, mm-hmm. um, who who he does screenwriting too, actually. But I, I interviewed him when I was a young, you know, my early 20s. He was a big hero of mine. And as I was leaving his house, I said to him, John, have got just one bit of advice for me. He said, yeah, brevity. And I thought, that's a shit bit of advice, brevity. You know, it's rubbish. <laughs> but it took me like 20 years to work out that, yeah, it really matters. It really matters, and actually, really great writing um, is that is that you know clarity is, is con- concise but packed with meaning. You know, so that's the difficult stuff. It's easy to write a hundred twenty thousand word book um, on on the science of storytelling. It's much harder to write an eighty thousand or a sixty thousand word book on the science of storytelling. But if you if you crack the brevity, you'll get much bigger, much bigger audience. You know, yeah. So that, that's the creative lesson. That the person is 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 that is that is that brevity is is really hard but really important i uh, when i was I, I always used to be told like when i asked some of my early when i was early on I'm like what advice you gave me they go patience and i'm like oh that's crap patience yeah. is a crap <laughs> patience what's yeah. it's bullshit that's crap no yeah. and now when people ask me what are you doing I'm like patience man just yeah. patience <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. such a long road you don't understand yeah. but you yeah. can't understand when you're 20 you don't understand patience no. No, and, you, when, and when you're 20, you don't understand brevity. You think, oh, I'm an artist. Guys. <laughs> well, my amazing ideas. Who I'm the best. Tire of this. <laughs> yeah. Who could possibly tire of my genius? Yeah. <laughs> who? who yeah. I mean, I'll just, yeah. you know, I'll wax up. A- when you're 40, you're like, shut up. <laughs> just shut yeah. your hole and get to the point. I've got, exactly. I've got Games yeah. of Thrones to go watch. I don't yeah. have time for you, yeah. sir. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, and then um, where can people find you and your books and more about what you do? Um, so uh, willstore.com, W-I-L-L-S-T-O-R-R.com. And I tweet at wstore, at W-S-T-O-R-R. Um, and on, actually on YouTube, if you just Google my name on YouTube, there's a, a, there's a free, there's free kind of five videos of introduction to science of storytelling with some sort of basic, the basic ideas and um some sort of good takeaway kind of tips so if any of you are interested in the stuff i've been talking about hit youtube and there's there's uh, there's five short films that i've made uh, on there as a kind of starter oh my god well man, I, I like i said before man i could talk to you for hours about <laughs> this this is a, a really been an amazing episode i have probably another 20 questions easily that we could keep talking about, but, but I'm going to take your advice. Brevity, sir. Brevity. <laughs> so, um, thank you again so much for coming on the show no, and, and, really and helping us. Uh, yeah. Really, thank you so much. I want to thank Will for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs today. I told you guys this would be a really, really interesting and fascinating conversation. And I think we held up our part of the bargain because Will made me think about story in a completely different way and just coming at it from the brain's point of view, which is really, really a powerful thing. I recommend you buy his book and read it ASAP. It's available everywhere on Audible, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and so on. If you want to get links to the book and anything else we spoke about in this episode, including his amazing TED Talk, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 083. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 